Hello, welcome to our first of our In Conversation events here around the topic of material methods. My name is Sophie Woodward and I'm a senior lecturer in sociology at the University of Manchester. I'm also a co-investigator for the NCRM and I lead in the creative methods area. Hello, my name is Natasha Latskuch and I am a lecturer at the Department of Educational Research at Lancaster University. Okay, so I think we can continue and start talking about material methods. Um, so, Sophie, um, what are material methods? Well, material methods are methods that are kind of speak to the relationship between objects and the research that people do. And as a term, it's not something that's been around for very long, although people have been doing material culture research for ages. It's actually a phrase that I created in the book I wrote recently. And the reason I created it was to really speak to this relationship between material culture and methods. So in my understanding of the term, it has two different uh, meanings and the first is it speaks to the methods that people use to understand material culture or materiality or even research into materials so the idea that actually some methods will help us to understand that we're not just looking at people we're looking at maybe people object relations or even understanding things themselves so the idea that we can develop or change social science methods to help us do that so that's the first meaning. And then the second meaning is for uh, people who want to use object based research to understand anything. So the idea is it's not just for people who are interested in materiality or material culture. It's for people who are interested in anything. So, for example, if you're interested, say, in memory, you might think that actually I'm going to use an object interview because that will help me understand memory. So the idea then is that it's methods that use objects in some form in order to kind of generate different kinds of responses. So those are the two sort of different meanings. And I think then that has implications for who it's of interest to and who it's relevant for, because yes, of course it's relevant for people who do research in materiality and material culture, but it's also a relevance to any social scientist who's interested in just more creative methods of research. So in lots of ways, I think I would really love to see material methods become part of that broader rubric of creative methods. And I think, the, the other thing around that as well is that it it kind of crosses disciplines you know so obviously you and I are from different disciplines and again if you look at you know the people who do research within what we might define as material methods I might not call it that they come from all over so, so sociology anthropology education geography art design really massive range of subjects and I think that's what's you know really kind of exciting about it and in terms of what exam you know what material methods are specifically it can be things like cultural probes it can be ethnography object interviews um kind of follow the thing methods so some of them are more obviously material so like an object interview is clearly it's got the word object in the title that's a kind of clue but even ethnography which lots of people who do ethnography are not interested in material culture but the idea is you can develop that method in order to speak to it so that's broadly speaking how i understand material methods Yes, and, and where does your interest in material methods come from? And I mean, there are two reasons. One is that I have personal reasons for it, and the other is a kind of academic reason. And obviously the personal is always academic, given that I'm a researcher. But the material culture thing is partly coming from the fact that there's masses of research on the theoretical understanding of materiality on material culture there's also as a consequence loads of empirical research now some of this has been going on for you know centuries uh, some of it more broadly comes within what we might call the material turn although i'm slightly reticent to use that term because it implies that before that nobody looked at material culture but there certainly has been like a massive expansion in the field of material culture since then and i think what that is really interesting about that is that you get a parallel field of research in visual methods in sensory methods so the methodological literature and there's loads of wonderful exciting stuff on that but there's almost nothing that crosses the two on you know there's no kind of field of material methods as yet and i think it really struck me as a kind of strange gap um, and so people are clearly doing material methods because they've got empirical data on it, but there's a lack of reflection and development and expansion on that field. So you can find examples, but they are very few and far between. So I think partly I think it's a really important area to develop. But the other side of it, as I say, is a personal journey and it. 
for me it came from when I started started my research journey doing my PhD and that's into women's wardrobes and clothing and I, it was a material culture project I was interested in the materiality of clothing and I realized I knew nothing about it you know I'm a social scientist I thought I know nothing about I didn't even know the words to use I thought how what words do you use to describe clothing and I was writing down about them and I knew nothing and I thought I ought to understand this stuff and so I think it made me realize that actually I really needed to think about methods for understanding this. And it wasn't just about going to material scientists and saying, well, you know about materials, I know about people. Um, it's also about thinking, how can we expand social science methods to understand materiality? So how can we develop methods like observation and interviews in order to do that? And I think, so for me personally, it's been something that I, became aware of my own inability to do something and that's kind of been one of my real drivers over the years is to try and try and develop that so it's been a life kind of career long interest but it's only now that I'm starting to more explicitly think actually I'd like to see this develop even further. That's fascinating so Sophie um, could you then give us an example of how um, a material method would work yeah, sure. So, uh, for example, I, I mean, I've done lots of different ones, but let's take ethnography because that's a, a method that's used in lots of different ways. So ethnography involves obviously participant observation, hanging out with people, watching what they do. And if we were to do that in a sense of thinking really about material culture, some of it I would see as kind of almost what we might call attuning yourself. So attuning yourself to what do people do with stuff? So the idea that what we're observing and participating in is not just people and what they say, it's also what are they doing with the objects around them? And also, um, you know, thinking about when they talk, how are they talking about the stuff around them? What are the things themselves doing? And actually that can really give you a very different perspective on what's happening. Um, and so, you know, that's one way, but also again, in interviews, I already mentioned, that's possibly the most accessible to someone who wants to get into material methods, knows nothing about them. When you're doing an interview, instead of just talking to someone, asking them to bring along an object. And when they talk about that object, you start to realize that actually you're not just doing an interview about uh, their memories. When you have an object with them, you understand that actually you're understanding how the object materializes memories as well. And that will give them different memories, different stories that wouldn't have come had they not brought the object along. So I think the object interview is actually possibly the most accessible one sometimes for people to try. Right, and, and where do you see material methods going? So what is the future of material methods? Uh, I think the future is expansive and wonderful, I hope. Um, I think partly I hope that in explicitly kind of naming it, that will in turn lead to more kind of explicit reflection and discussion around it. Because actually, when we have something that's called material methods, people can start to recognise, well, actually, that's something that I do or how could I, you know, reframe what I'm doing in that way? And I think one of the big possibilities I see is around interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary, sorry, collaboration. So the idea that actually, as I've already said, lots of disciplines already do this. How can we think about this together and develop dialogues around it? And so one of the possibilities around this is around the reframing of existing methods. So the idea that actually, as I've already said, lots of people do visual methods, but thinking about the ways in which actually these are also material quite often, um, already they're material, but equally they can be developed and expanded in that way. So I think some of it is actually just about the reflecting differently on existing methods, but some of it is about developing new methods. So one of the new methods I'd be really interested in, for example, is around um, methods around, for example, inventories and collections, because actually that can allow us to think differently about things in relation to like wardrobes and attics and stuff like that. But it's not just about new methods. It's also just about reframing stuff that people already do. Um, and so I think that actually for me, one of the most interesting areas is around this dialogue between um, dialogue between the kind of material methods and also the sensory and the visual as well. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, that's why this in conversation event becomes interesting. And so obviously, I think that kind of leads a little bit on to you and what you do, because, you know, I think a lot of the, there's a lot of scope for thinking about this kind of inquiry graphic based method that you're interested in. Um, and then thinking about what, how that can help us sort of develop new material methods. So, I mean, it might be useful perhaps to just to start with a basic question what are inquiry graphic methods right so inquiry graphic methods use visual uh, media um, such as photographs videos drawings sketches 
um, in research, pedagogical, as well as analytical processes. And in that way, there are also types of visual and multimodal methods, but where inquiry graphics um, methods differ from their relatives uh, is in proposing relational thinking uh, as its key principle. Um, and what I mean by relational thinking is actually relational thinking argues that there is an intrinsic link between what is traditionally known as abstract theory or, or, or concept or idea from one side and an embodied image from the other. So whether it's an external pictorial image or, or we're talking about picture sensation imagining one's mind. So it does relate also to, um, you can say that it relates to other embodied sensations because we can talk about um, um, concepts and also sensations on the other hand. Um, so this image concept or concept sense connectedness is explored and analyzed um, in a manner that is inspired by Charles Sanders Peirce's semiotics and his tri triadic sign relations. Um, that, I mean, that, that's interesting. Could you say maybe a little bit more about, about that, what you mean by that, and then maybe what that makes the kind of new about the method? Yes, of course. Um, so this triadic sign or the sign triad um, would uh, work something like this. So let's say I sense something. So for example, I see an image and then the sense thing is, um, is one side of the triad. So, um, so that's an image form um, with its content and, and its medium. And um, so what the re image refers to or what it represents is another triadic component and, and um, how someone's mind interprets it is the third component. So that's, that forms a triad. And um, these uh, triadic relations, uh, they happen simultaneously in everyday life. You know, when we um, just go about our lives and, and we look around ourselves and see the world and we interpret it in this kind of triadic way. And so, but as components, uh, they are not, the same um, and they're not insignificant and so it helps if we dig deeper and understand both um, the parts and the whole. So um, I, for example we usually um, interpret images by just jumping to, to what they mean symbolically so, um, so what they remind us of and but, but the photograph does not only um, really, uh, or, or it does not really show um, these things that we interpret. The photograph shows something that we have learned to interpret and, um, uh, you know, um, uh, influenced by our socio-cultural um, environment and context. And, and, and then we interpret it and give it some symbolic meaning. So this is actually where inquiry graphics um, differ from other visual methods by acknowledging these different levels of interpretation and also following, you know, Percy's uh, sign triad. And so, um, so it, it links the meaning of the picture content to the meanings of any idea or concept that is being explored. Um, so um, I'd say that it encourages participants, uh, but also learners, because you can use it as a pedagogic method to um, think deeper, to think in an analytical way, um, and also think critically, um, uh, and to consider the represented content um, as an inspiration, actually, for ideas, for kind of analogical and associative thinking. And um, so by for example, by considering um, its quality and, and you know, the social cultural history of the things that are represented as an inspiration, as a trigger for reflection. So unpacking these triadic relations via inquirographic methods and analysis can actually help explore how we form, how we translate, understand, negotiate and materialize concepts so that you, you can see the, the connection between you know, images and materiality. Um, so what I mean by concepts, you know, we, we all talk about these grand concepts uh, and experiences that we call, I don't know, culture, society, economy, um, ideology, politics, justice, um, and so on. So 
in that way, um, graphics or such as photographs can um, um, help um, actually connect these big um, seemingly abstract concepts to how they are represented or materialized by photographs. So basically, photographs can show how a theoretical concept let's say in education psychology, and I can give an example of constructivism, could be explored by an image. Um, uh, and, and, and that, that, you know, that can uh, actually help um, participants or learners think deeper about the concept. Um, another thing I can say is that um, inquiry graphics um, invite participants and learners um, to pay close attention to the nuances of visual interpretation um, and treat them as triggers for held beliefs, you know, for uncovering, you know, subconscious um, beliefs and, 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 and knowledge, prior knowledge, um, as well as for new insights that would not be possible actually without the image content. Um, in that way, they can be useful for any researcher uh, in, in any field, any discipline, as, as you were saying um, earlier, or for any activity that aims to understand how participants or learners conceptualize and interpret a topic or an issue or a challenge, a disciplinary concept. So they are particularly useful, for example, in participatory and action research, in reflective, creative and critical thinking, uh, pe pedagogy, um, in order to illuminate you know, differences and similarities in opinions and, and, and beliefs. Yeah, that's, I mean, I think that inquiry element, the thing you're talking about, the triggering is really interesting because actually one of the things about object interviews is around how actually an object can kind of jar people into thinking differently or so that inquiry element, I can see some real connections there. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really interesting. Could you, I'm, I'm kind of interested in how that works in practice. Could you kind of maybe give an example to elaborate that a little bit more? Okay, so, um, so let's say you are interested in understanding how a group of people or, or your learners perceive and understand a concept or a problem or an idea. So, um, for example, okay, what, what, is, what is your experience of I don't know, shopping or what is their experience of personal identity? Or, or you know, now very topical of, of the coronavirus lockdown, or, um, or or of higher education because my field is educational research um, and and uh, higher education education in general. So you would then engage this group of people in reflection or conversation around images that they, um, for example, created or or they chose but also um, around any kind of tailor-made images of your own uh, chosen, you know, of your own choice, you know, it's, it's your own chosen topic. And that really, um, you know, relates or, or um, positions in query graphics very, in, in a very close relationship with um, well-known uh, visual methods such as, you know, photo elicitation and photo voice. And so you would uh, do that and you would talk with your participants or with, with learners um, um, by inquiry graphics elicitation interviews, or, or you can also organize inquiry graphics focus groups um, with the questions that actually follow these triadic um, inquiry graphics model and um, so that's where the inquiry graphics as, as a kind of uh, species of, of both um, material methods and visual methods um, differing you know, from, from those other methods um, or you can also think about how people can um, um, uh, for example capture and document their experiences over time so they might use mobile phones for you know, image um, uh, collection, uh, or they, make, they might want to make notes about those images um, that will all of course serve the purposes of, of, of the research or the purposes of, of teaching and learning. Um, so in the educational pedagogic context, uh, students will reflect on key concepts in their domain uh, by choosing or creating an image and, and writing an analytical and reflective narrative around that image. So this approach basically celebrates uh, uh, participants' creative agency and their personal and prior experiences, you know, in their worlds and interpretations. 
Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, I can already see quite a lot of connections between what I've said around material methods and actually one that strikes me as I, one thing I think and written about material methods is the ways in which they can be provocative and how actually things can provoke people either in terms of what they say, how they reflect, what they write. So I can see a lot of kind of synergies there already. Uh, could you say a bit more about what, what do you think the, you know, how do you think these methods relate to material methods? Um, yes, of course. So, um, so inquiry graphics, uh, they, they do relate really well to material methods, I'd say. And, and um, uh, they're part or, or species of material uh, methods. And this is because visual media um, are in close relationship with the world's materiality. And um, either as representing this materiality or being connected to some um, materiality, whether it's organic or otherwise, um, so such as hand, you know, paint, um, pencil, digital mouse, or, or, or body movements. Uh, so in that way, photographs, videos, sketches, paintings, graphic novels, or comics can all be part of inquiry graphics uh, methods, and they basically capture. They can cap they can capture not all of them, but of course you know a lot of them can capture and do capture the world's external reality and materiality as well as ideas beliefs imagination and metaphors and and this helps actually investigate this materiality and its relationship with uh, the ideas they're uh, connected with they're affiliated with or that we actually connect this materiality to those ideas and how we do that and why we do that so you know it, it, it actually acts in, in in different and versatile ways so that in that way um inquiry graphics are related to uh material methods um i can just mentioned in, in, in one of my recent articles about critical media literacy, I actually explained this connectedness between a uh, world's external materiality and, and, and photographs. Yeah, interesting. I'm interested you mentioned sketching actually, because uh, the research center I'm in the Morgan Center, we had a resident sketcher and she worked with me on some things. It's a really interesting way to think about materiality that. And um, so could you say then what you think the kind of you know, possibilities and futures are for this method? Sure, um, yes, and just to, to, to link to, to your comment, uh, uh, exactly, and I think the, the um, role of, of, of people, of artists, you know, who can sketch, or as I say, resident artists, resident sketchers, is um, there, is a, there is a huge potential, but it's still an underexplored and not that well understood area. So that would be a good way, you know, forward to think about that. Um, so what are the possibilities or futures for inquiry graphics methods? Well, um, I, I do hope, I hope, I hope that there are many researchers and teachers who can relate, you know, to inquiry graphics and who would um, like to use adapt you know appropriate um, uh, these methods in their own context for their own purposes and in their own ways and in principle in choreographics uh, approaches are this is this is actually a both both a conceptual and, and theoretical approach because it builds on on, on semiotic um, theory um, it, it presents this image concept body mind abstract concrete relationship so that's more kind of conceptual and theoretical and it is um, um, and, and it is a pedagogic and research method as well so there are inquiry graphics um, uh, methods uh, as, as I mentioned earlier I talked about them earlier so possibilities to apply them are numerous and versatile I think not just in social sciences but across disciplines and 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 specifically um, as I mentioned before, in participatory research, but also in, in pedagogy. Um, so many fields could be linked to these methods and, and approaches. And, and you were talking earlier about um, material culture, but there's also sociomateriality mm. and critical theory, uh, social practice theory and identity theories, even uh, things such as, uh, you know, cultural historical activity theory, educational theories, and, and, and more. I, th I, think, I, I think, you know, this is, 
this is really there is in, in a way no end you know where you can stop so, so yes let us do this together great yeah so i mean that leads on to then kind of the purpose of this in conversation series and i think in many ways it's partly for us to think about the possibilities of what we can do with material methods and how that can link to other methods and i think that in a lot of what we're interested in developing is this idea of interdisciplinarity so the conversations between disciplines about different kinds of methods but also about developing connections so as i said at the beginning about there's this kind of visual sensory you know thinking about actually material is also part of both of those and we've hopefully established today about the kind of connections between these inquiry graphic methods and material and you can start to see really interesting synergies and i think rather than stand alone it's through conversations that these connections and synergies that emerge and how we can start to think about um you know possible futures but also i think about establishing material methods as a as a bigger area so although as i said before people have been doing material culture research for a long time we can start to think about what might a field of material methods look like um and how might we develop this in collaboration and in discussion with different different kind of areas absolutely and and uh, what we are trying to do um in our series uh, is we're talking with um, we want to talk with with national and international uh, colleagues whose work um, uh, relates to material methods across uh, you know, visual, tangible, digital domains uh, and, and how you know, these different domains actually re relate to material methods. Um, so in, in that way, we're developing um, uh, and fur further, we're developing further this field, as, as you said, of, of material methods and also network um, for and with anyone interested in these types of uh, methods. So this is one of our in conversation uh, series or episode. Um, and, um, you know, this is a part of the creative um, and innovative methods uh, strand of the uh, National Center for Research Methods. And um, so we hope that it was useful and uh, that you enjoyed it. <laughs>